Okay, let's begin then. Hi everyone, good evening. I'm Yuval Abrams, the NEH Chair in Humanities and Visiting Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Albright. Thanks for coming this evening to our talk. And I wanna, before I begin, I wanna thank the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Experience Events Committee for making this event possible. And I wanna thank all of you for coming out here this evening or in wherever you are. I am delighted to introduce our guest, that's Professor Michael Strevens. Professor Strevens was born in New Zealand and moved to the US to undertake a PhD in philosophy at Rutgers University. He's taught philosophy at Iowa State University, Stanford and NYU since 2004. He's the recipient of the 2017-18 Guggenheim Fellowship. Professor Strevens works in the nature of science, areas like scientific explanation, complex systems, probability, causation, and other related areas, including cognitive psychology and its relation to scientific thinking. He's the author of multiple books, including Bigger Than Chaos, Depth, Tychomancy, Thinking Off Your Feet, and most recently, the book we're gonna talk about this evening, The Knowledge Machine, let's see if you can see that, the How Irrationality Created Modern Science. And I wanna just make a couple of technical announcements for those of you watching on YouTube, please note there may be a slight delay. You can enter your questions in the chat box and I'll monitor them. We're gonna do a Q&A at the end of the talk. For those Albright students who are watching this on Zoom, for Zoom credit, you for experience credit, sorry, there'll be a poll midway through and a poll at the end. You need to answer them both. And you can ask your questions directly either in the chat box or if I can hone in on you. Um, I just want to make a technical, I want to make sure that YouTube is working. And after that goes, I will turn the podium over to Professor Strevens. Okay, Professor Strevens, please. Well, thanks very much for inviting me uh, here or there tonight. Um, I'm delighted to be talking to you about my new book, uh, The Knowledge Machine. Let me just uh, get some slides up and running for you. And there we go. So, this book is about this very uh, marvelous and very strange thing called science. And I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the ways in which its strangeness uh, is responsible for its being so wonderful. Um, I'm gonna focus in particular, as my book does, on uh, two questions about science, two big questions. Let's begin though by uh, reflecting on just what an amazing thing science is. So in the course of the last 100, 200, 300 years, we have learned so much about deep space, about uh, the wonders of life. Um, we've managed to get to some pretty interesting places and to um, at least um, improve some uh, pretty terrible problems. How is science able to do all of this? Uh, well, I think if you polled uh, a bunch of scientists, and in fact, we'll, we'll do a little bit of a poll later on in this talk, then perhaps the single word that uh, you would hear most often mentioned in explanations of science's success would be evidence. Uh, if someone wants to uh, make a picture of science in action, what are they gonna do? They're gonna to get together some attractive actors and then they're gonna stage something like this. Scientists at work gathering empirical evidence, making observations, making measurements, uh, uh, turning up those little facts that will tell us which theories are right and which are wrong, which explanations of the beginning of life or the beginning of the universe are the ones that really get the story right. So there you have it, science equals evidence. Uh, you might put it all uh, rather pithily as follows in this uh, nice little aphorism here, credit must be given to theories only if what they affirm agrees with the observed facts. 
Oddly enough, though, uh, this quote is not from a Nobel Prize winner in physics uh, or one of my colleagues at NYU, but a philosopher, Aristotle, who lived two and a half thousand years ago. So there is Aristotle uh, 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 writing about 2000 years before science really took off during the scientific revolution. And he knew how important evidence was as he did his own uh, construction of theories of physics and biology and psychology and all the rest. Somehow though, uh, for all his brilliance, and he was a very brilliant thinker, he was not able to flick the switch that uh, is responsible for the wonderful things I was showing you on the previous slides. Uh, Aristotle is very interesting, but he's not often very right. Uh, it was really only, as I say, about 2000 years later in the 1600s during what's called the scientific revolution that science reached a kind of an escape velocity uh, and, and gave us uh, all of the treasures that we have today. And a few problems as well, I guess I have to admit. So Aristotle was onto something when he said uh, that, that we must focus on theories, we must only accept theories that, that uh, uh, match the evidence. But apparently he did not have the whole story uh, or else maybe it would have been uh, Socrates walking on the moon. Uh, so here are my two big questions. The first is, what is it that Aristotle was missing? What is it that modern science does with the evidence that Aristotle and uh, the medieval philosophers in the Islamic world, in the Christian world, uh, in the Chinese world, uh, uh, the philosophers of South Asia, of, of what's now India, uh, uh, the philosophers of Persia, what were they not doing with the evidence that science does now that makes it so powerful? And second, why did it take so long to figure out how to do this thing? What is it that, that held back the development of science when, when the Greeks were able to invent democracy, mathematics, uh, and, uh, and many, many people around that time were creating marvelous poetry and drama and so on. These are the two questions I want to uh, sketch some answers to tonight. I'm going to begin with the person who is perhaps the 20th century's foremost thinker about science. Uh, his name was Thomas Kuhn. Maybe uh, that's a name that's familiar to many of you. Um, Kuhn wrote a famous book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It first came out in 1962, uh, in which he gave a really very creative and very surprising story about uh, uh, how science works. Now, I have to warn you, I think this story is wrong, but in its wrongness, there is a rightness. And in that rightness, we can find the right story. And that's why I'm beginning with Kuhn, not to criticize him so much, to, but as to, to, in order to get inspiration from him uh, in thinking about science. Uh, Kuhn's most famous phrase, which I expect many of you have heard, is paradigm shift. Kuhn introduced that idea to the world. And he saw scientific progress as a series of these events, paradigm shifts, in which one great way of thinking about the world, one great worldview, one great theory gives way to another. For example, the old Ptolemaic paradigm in astronomy, uh, in which uh, the planets all orbit the Earth, was replaced by Copernicus's paradigm, in which the planets, including the Earth, orbit the Sun. And at the same time, uh, uh, old ideas about physics, including Aristotle's ideas, were replaced by the ideas of uh, thinkers such as Galileo and Newton. That's a paradigm shift. This great transition from a, uh, a whole way of conceiving about the way some part of the world works, uh, such as the structure of the, the celestial world, uh, uh, changes profoundly. Another more recent change, Newton's own physics uh, was replaced by Einstein's physics. So we went from Newtonian gravity, uh, F equals uh, MA and all of that to Newtonian, uh, to Einsteinian physics and Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, well, what are these paradigms really? What's going on with these paradigms? The first thing you should know is that in Kuhn's way of thinking, a scientist's mind is ruled by a paradigm. So uh, these worldviews are not just 
ideas that scientists are playing around with, experimenting with. They're not just following them because they're fashionable. These paradigms are kind of uh, pretty deeply built into scientists' ways of thinking. Of course, they can change, hence the shifts. But nevertheless, when a scientist is doing normal science, Kuhn says, their mind is ruled by the paradigm. Uh, and furthermore, it's a good thing. This kind of subservience to the paradigm is actually what's so important for science to work. So let me say a little bit more about what Kuhn had in mind here. Uh, the Im really important thing about a paradigm for Kuhn was that it's not just a theory. It's not just a set of big ideas. Uh, it's a kind of a complete recipe for finding the answer to any scientific question, solving any scientific problem within the paradigm scope. Uh, it's not just, uh, uh, as I say, uh, a set of laws or mathematical equations like F equals MA. It's a set of questions which you should use these equations to answer. It's a set of procedures for using the equations to answer the questions, to build models, as scientists say, of the phenomena in question. Uh, you can become a highly proficient scientist just by learning this recipe. And what you do, uh, what Kuhn thinks scientists do when they're, when they're following the recipe, when they're, when they're doing normal science, is simply going through these steps and uh, uh, investing as little creative, original, groundbreaking, paradigm shifting thought into the process as possible. So scientists doing normal science are not thinking about shifting the paradigm, far from it. They're entirely devoted to the paradigm and using the paradigm to do their science. So a Newtonian physicist is gonna to try to understand everything that happens in the world as a result of uh, forces, of different forces, um, each force acting uh, in a certain way to accelerate bodies according to Newton's famous second law and so on. The reason they're so devoted to the paradigm is because they think the paradigm really cannot fail. If they just follow this recipe, they will answer all the questions. They'll get, as I put it here, a complete picture of the world. Okay, now why should that be a good thing? Uh, uh, if, you've been, if you've been following along, you'll see Kuhn is saying here that really what makes scientists uh, 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 so characteristic, what makes science really different is not a kind of open-mindedness, uh, not a kind of rebelliousness, but rather a, 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 a incredible, incredibly conservative attitude, uh, refusal to look anywhere else but toward the single recipe uh, in order to do science, the single recipe that works for your particular kind of science, so a Newtonian physics for a physicist, for example. Why is that a good thing? Why is closing scientists' minds to the alternatives a good thing? Here's what Kuhn says, and what I think was one of the, the nicest sentences he ever wrote. He says, by focusing attention on a small range of relatively esoteric problems, the problems that the paradigm gives you the recipe to solve, uh, what the paradigm does is it, and I'll just start reading the quote again, it forces scientists to investigate some part of nature in a detail and depth that would otherwise be unimaginable. Okay, so he's saying that if scientists didn't have this incredible focus, this incredible narrow-mindedness, they, they would not have this uh, incredibly penetrating, uh, powerful, uh, and very narrow focus to their research that is ultimately successful for scientists, for sciences, uh, responsible for scientists' success. Let me give you a few examples of the kinds of things that, um, that, that the kinds of scientific experiments, uh, uh, this is all comes after Kuhn wrote his book, but that the kinds of things he might have had in mind when he was thinking that the importance of the paradigm is to, is to motivate scientists to, to do what they do with this detail and depth. I'll begin with a very recent one. I don't know if uh, you recognize this picture. Here's, here's a physics experiment. This is just one half of the experiment, which is built in the hinterlands of, this, of Washington state. Those uh, structures you see are each over two miles long and they're incredibly straight. What they're there to do is to measure gravity waves. This is one part of the LIGO uh, installation 
that successfully detected gravity, gravity waves just a few years ago. Now, as I've said, these tubes are very long, as many of you may know. What's perhaps less well known is that the process that led to their building was also very long. So the development of the LIGO idea, this um, idea that we could test, in this case, Einstein's theory of relativity by, by uh, trying to detect gravity waves. Uh, this idea was first developed in the 1960s. Um, the scientists who first developed it uh, found uh, the way pretty hard going at first. Uh, it was gonna be a very expensive experiment to build. Its funding was nearly cut off in the 1980s. Finally, the, the um, NSF, the National Found Science Foundation, um, uh, extended more funding. They got the whole thing built uh, by around uh, uh, just after 2000. And then they went to work running their experiments, trying to detect the waves. And for eight years, they found absolutely nothing. So this is after 30 years of working, the whole thing more or less almost falling through. They spent eight years looking for these gravity waves and seeing nothing. Then they did some improvements to the setup, still nothing. Finally, they did another round of improvements and uh, beginning in 1915, they switched on the apparatus and two years later, they had their Nobel prizes. And these are the very same physicists, or two out of the three Nobel prize winners are the same physicists who were first developing this, these ideas in the 1960s. They stuck with it for uh, 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 60, 50, 50 plus years, just working away, uh, getting absolutely no results for most of those years. Uh, they were all over 75 years old by the time they got their Nobel prizes. That is the kind of devotion that it took to make this experiment work. Uh, that is the kind of detail and depth that Kuhn is talking about. And so we're able now for the first time to detect the sound, to hear the sound, if you like, of two black holes colliding, artist's impression. Here's a very different uh, place, uh, also rather dry, um, but another, another testament to the extreme motivation and focus of scientific investigators. This is the island of Daphne Major, which is in the Galapagos Islands. It's about a half mile across. Uh, now, ever since 1973, so again, that's almost 50 years, uh, the same two biologists, Rosemary and Peter Grant, have been going to Daphne Major uh, every summer uh, and spending the whole summer there counting Galapagos finches, the same finches that Darwin uh, so famously wrote about and that later figured in, in uh, uh, some of his most um, interesting thought about evolution by natural selection. And the grants have been going there and what they've been doing is uh, getting to know all the finches personally and observing them in great detail every year for almost 50 years. Uh, in the course of these observations, they learned many interesting things. Uh, camped out on that uh, tiny little rock there where I can uh, I think I can tell you just by visual inspection, not a whole lot is going on. Uh, one of the most amazing things they discovered though, in the course of about 20 years of observation was uh, they, they in fact observed the creation of a new species of finch by hybridization. Here it is. Uh, that, took, that took them, um, what was it? About 30 to 40 years of going to this island every summer to follow the finches but an amazing discovery. I'll give you one more. This is uh, Andrew Shalley, who was one of two scientists who led rival teams uh, racing one another to discover the uh, structure, the chemical structure of a brain hormone called TRH uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and uh, they, the, um, the great difficulty in, dis in discovering the structure of this hormone is that it, it appears in incredibly tiny amounts in the brain. So Shally and le the leader of the other team, Roger uh, Guillermo, had to spend most of their time not doing anything glamorous, but simply, uh, well, they and their many assistants, simply trucking in uh, tons and tons of animal brains, in Shally's case, pig brains, crushing those brains and extracting from the brains microscopic amounts of the substance TRH, trying to build up enough that they would finally be able to put to work their techniques for determining structure. Took them 
um, almost 10 years. As Charlie says here, uh, the real, what was really important in this experiment was not money. It certainly, it wasn't uh, having some brilliant new technique. It wasn't uh, 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 deep, astonishing theoretical insight or fancy mathematics, uh, as he puts it here. It was simply the will. But these two teams were willing to turn up to work uh, every week and spend almost all their time doing just this one extremely boring task so that they could find this, which is the structure of TRH. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of a sense, I hope, of uh, some of the extreme tedium, uh, uh, the extreme frustration sometimes when your experiments aren't working or your funding runs out, uh, the incredible concentration, uh, the need to find uh, almost infinite reservoirs of uh, inspiration and motivation to just keep turning up every day at the lab uh, to, uh, or on the island uh, to extract this kind of very detailed evidence, the, the comings and goings of all of these finches. So the grants actually observed uh, the finches mating who, uh, who created that hybrid, uh, the new species, uh, for example, that kind of unbelievable attention to detail um, that turns up evidence, which uh, Kuhn thought was, and I think he was right about this, was essential to scientific progress. So these scientists are, in Kuhn's telling of the story, um, completely, uh, uh, um, completely convinced that the paradigm is correct, that they have the right recipe for doing science. And that's why they have the confidence to push it so hard. So uh, the recipe says, do this and something magnificent will happen. You might have to do it for 40 years and it might be very boring and it might be very frustrating. And it's certainly gonna be time consuming and it might be very expensive, but keep doing it and you'll get there in the end. And that guarantee of the Nobel prize at the end of the tunnel is what keeps them going. So that's where the evidence comes from. But then something else as well. Uh, we know, even if the scientists don't, that these paradigms have problems. Uh, the Ptolemaic paradigm was certainly incorrect. The planets do not orbit the Earth. The Newtonian paradigm in physics was extremely successful, still used by NASA today to, to, uh, to land on uh, uh, the moon, Mars, and, and uh, uh, rendezvous with various asteroids and so on. But that too had these little problems. And by figuring out what those problems were, by finding tiny discrepancies between the theory and the data, scientists were able to realize something was wrong. And then somebody like Einstein could come along with a totally new idea about how physics worked, about how gravity worked, where it's not really a force after all, but rather a, a kind of a disturbance in the space-time continuum. Uh, 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 because of this, because of these, 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 these extremely intricate facts that don't quite match what the paradigm says they should match, uh, scientists in effect discover the flaws in the paradigm. Okay. They, they're trying to squeeze out every last drop of truth, truth from the paradigm. And instead they show it to be wrong. They crush the life out of it. And that's how scientific progress happens. That's how the big changes in science, the paradigm shifts happen. It's the little facts that kill the big theories. But to find those little facts, to turn up those little facts requires so much motivation that the only way you can get human beings to do it is to convince them that the paradigm is in fact correct. By convincing them that it's correct, you, you manipulate them into doing the things that will show that it's incorrect. That's Kuhn's amazing paradox. And that is a quite extraordinary thought and a, a wonderful story. So is it right? Well, I'm just gonna focus on one part of it. Uh, well, I guess I'm gonna focus on two parts because I'm gonna take away something from this story to build a new story. Uh, sorry. Uh, I just got interrupted by what's going on here. There we are. Sorry about that. 
um, <clears throat> uh, it's key to Kuhn's story that scientists are really convinced the paradigm is correct. That's what motivates them. Uh, but if we actually look around, and um, sociologists of science have been especially uh, influential in, in taking a closer look at what's really going on in scientists' minds as they do their research. We find that we don't have the kind of slavish devotion to the paradigm that Kuhn uh, envisaged. So here's just one example, or I'm gonna give you two examples. Here's one example from uh, uh, work when the Large Hadron Collider was being updated. This is the big particle accelerator in CERN uh, in Switzerland. And a lot of scientists, a lot of physicists were really excited about the upgrade to the collider because they were hoping that they would be able to use it to show that the current uh, dominant theory in particle physics, the so-called standard model is wrong. Here you have this wonderful quote. Uh, we wanna break physics. Or as uh, one of the scientists said, we have a fantastic model that we hate. Uh, so here are scientists who, who rather than believing in the, the correctness of their overarching theory, really want to overturn it. That doesn't sound very Kuhnian. Well, here's another example. Um, this is from a book uh, about uh, uh, one of the labs, not uh, uh, where that research on the brain hormone TRH took place. Uh, so um, the French, what do you call him? Anthropologist and philosopher Bruno Latour went and lived in one of these labs for a while. Well, he didn't sleep there, but he went in there every day and he just observed the scientists at work uh, and recorded what he found. And what he found was uh, a lot of Machiavellian maneuvering. And in particular, these small attempts, so this is a quote from uh, the, book, the book he wrote later about the experience, little attempts to change the rules in order to get ahead, okay? Here you have a case where, uh, where, uh, as he's putting it, the subspecialty, so this is all to do with this, this, this brain hormone stuff, subspecialty was redefined in terms of a new set of rules so that um, one of the rivals of the people in this lab uh, would, be, would be on the outer. They would no longer be doing the research in accordance with the appropriate rules. So here they are, scientists gaming the rules. Uh, they're twisting the paradigm in order to get ahead. Again, exactly the opposite of what Kuhn says they must do in order for scientific progress to happen. So it seems that even if Kuhn's insight into the uh, importance of scientific motivation is correct, and I think it is, it can't be a unthinking devotion to a paradigm that's responsible for it. I'm gonna talk a little bit in the second half of this talk, I'm gonna say something about uh, how I think where I think that motivation comes from. But first, we're going to pause for some questions. So uh, over to you, Yuval. OK, I hope you hear me. I'm going to put the, um, Michael, do you hear me? I do hear you. Now, yeah. shall I um, stop sharing my screen? I'm, I'm going to stop. Stop. Yeah, stop the share. OK. And we're going to pull out the poll. Hold on. I'm going to poll the audience. This is for those of you. Um, Let's do that. Okay, those are, should be visible now. Please, if you're in the audience on Zoom, you can answer this poll. We'll, we'll give them a minute to do that. And maybe, maybe we should continue the talk while they're doing that and we'll display the results at the next segue before Q&A. Sounds okay. good. Okay, so uh, while that's underway, I will get back on with my story. Yeah, we don't, we don't see the poll. And Are we all set for me to continue? Yes. Great. Okay. So if science doesn't work, if these paradigms are not as uh, are controlling as Kuhn takes them to be, then what is going on with science? Uh, let me let me uh, 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 take a little bit of a closer look at what's really going on and what I call here the science game, at the rules of science. There's an old idea that science has a method and that that method consists above all in an objective rule for interpreting evidence. 
So that means that when science scientists turn up the evidence that they turn up, uh, they're going to come to agree on what the evidence says. Uh, uh, they will each go off and do their experiments, make their observations, and when they come back, they'll be able to agree on the basis of all the evidence they've collected, uh, which theories are right and which theories are wrong. Uh, I want to begin by talking a little bit about why we modern philosophers of science think this old idea can't be right. And uh, this will lead me up to uh, uh, an observation that will answer my question about motivation. So the problem with the old idea is simply that there is in fact an enormous amount of disagreement in science as to how to interpret the evidence. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of that disagreement, but uh, then I'll point to a certain kind of consensus below the disagreement, and we'll get back to the motivation story. Okay. Uh, here's a scientific dispute. It's an old dispute that, that went through the 1600s, the 1700s, and the 1800s about the nature of heat. The question is this, what is heat? And in particular, these are the two great ideas about the nature of heat. Is heat a kind of a fluid? So uh, something that flows from hot objects to cold objects, uh, in the course of which the cold objects warm up because they have more of this fluid stuff in them. Is heat like that? The whole metaphor of flowing suggests that it is. Or is heat rather uh, uh, the energy of um, the particles that make up matter vibrating in a kind of disordered way? In that case, the flow, what we call the flow of heat is really the communication of this vibration. Uh, in the same way that when your, your phone is on silent mode and it starts vibrating on your desk, your whole desk starts uh, buzzing. So heat is transferred from one thing to another. These are two ideas that were very much being debated in the early 19th century. Uh, the theory that heat is a fluid was called the caloric theory. Caloric was simply the name of the fluid. And the, heat, the idea that heat is this kind of motion, the mechanical theory. Uh, and here's what looks like a piece of decisive evidence. So this is really gonna, this is really gonna decide the issue between the caloric and the mechanical theory, okay? Between the fluid theory and the vibration theory, if you like. Heat is able to travel through a vacuum. How do we know that? Well, we go and lie on the beach and there we are. The heat from the sun uh, was warming us up and it's getting there traveling through uh, uh, millions of miles of interplanetary space, which is basically empty. Now, if heat is, uh, is molecular motion, then the only way it can travel is by uh, uh, having some kind of intervening stuff. The sun gets the intervening stuff vibrating and the intervening stuff gets our skin vibrating and that's how we get a sunburn. That's the story. But there is no intervening stuff. Space is a vacuum. So does that mean it's all over for the idea that heat is a vibration? Well, not necessarily. Uh, the heat theorists can always come back with some uh, more ideas. They can supplement their theory with additional posits that are going to save their theory from this observation by explaining how heat can actually travel uh, from the sun to the earth. One option is to say, well, that empty space isn't really empty after all. It's filled with this invisible stuff. Uh, often called the ether. And it's the vibration of that invisible stuff which allows the sun to warm us. Okay, that's one, that's one way of doing it. Maybe you think this sounds a bit sort of a little bit heading off in the direction of a conspiracy theory, this invisible stuff. We can't see it, we can't measure it, but uh, luckily it's there to save the theory. Uh, is there an alternative? Well, there is an alternative. It's radiation theory. Here the idea is that the motion of heat is actually in the sun. The sun's heat is actually transformed into something else. You could call the, this stuff uh, heat rays, heat radiation. That's able to travel through empty space because it's not vibration, it's something completely different vibra from vibration. Then when it gets to the earth, it hits us and um, the heat rays are transformed back into vibrations. The energy of the rays starts our molecules vibrating and that's why we feel warm on a hot sunny day. Well, that idea too um, seems a little bit of a stretch. I mean, we've invented this whole new form of matter just to get heat across empty space. But 
it's a legitimate scientific move to suggest this new explanation. Uh, uh, and the reason that scientists, even the reason that the proponents of the fluid theory, the enemies of the mechanical theory, will allow a new idea like this is because uh, they know that they can then put it to the test. So they're not going to allow the, the uh, molecular theorist just to say, oh, well, there's heat rays that get heat through empty space. They're going to say, now we've got to test that posit. How might you test it? Well, now I'm going to, I'm going to, um, uh, so, so far the story I've given is pretty much taken from the history of the science of heat. Now I'll, uh, now I'll introduce a little bit of alternative history uh, just to keep things simple. We might think this, okay, uh, what we'll do is we'll create a vacuum and we'll put a warm object at one end, a hot object at one end, uh, and see if it's, and its heat will travel through the vacuum. Uh, and we'll see what kinds of things might stop its heat traveling through the vacuum. For example, we might put a pane of glass in the middle of the vacuum, okay? Um, uh, now, if heat is a ray, like a light ray, it should just go straight through the glass and the glass won't make any difference at all. On the other hand, if the caloric theory is right and the heat is this fluid that's, as it were, being sprayed through space from the sun to us, then uh, you might expect the pane of glass to at least slow down the fluid. So what happens? We put the pane of glass in there. Uh, does it slow the passage of heat? Maybe it does. Does that mean it's all over for the mechanical theory who said, no, it's not gonna slow it at all? Well, not necessarily. They might say, you know, um, this glass could be in fact opaque to heat rays. Sure, it lets light through, but it doesn't have to let heat through. So you can see how this goes. Uh, every time you have an experiment that looks like it's gonna get you in trouble, you come up with some additional hypothesis that saves you. Well, suppose that the experiment comes out the other way around. Okay, it doesn't slow the passage of heat. Well, how is that? How is the glass not getting in the way of the caloric theory, uh, cal caloric fluid? Well, the caloric theorist can make up stories too. They can say, well, maybe the glass is, is if you're a particle of caloric fluid, the glass looks like a fishing net, okay? The holes, the gaps between the molecules and the glass are so huge that you just go gushing through. It doesn't slow you at all. Okay. So then what do we do? Well, in both cases, we can do more tests. Um, uh, if the mechanical theorist says, well, maybe the glass is opaque, we can try out different materials. Instead of the glass, we'll try and find some material that is transparent to heat rays. Uh, or if the caloric theorist gives this fishing net response, then again, we can try different stuff or try different layers of glass uh, and see if they slow down the fluid anymore. And that's the way science works. You have, um, in this case, proponents of two different theories. They're arguing with one another. They never really agree that they've found an experiment that, that decides the question. They keep coming up with new ideas to get around any embarrassing looking experimental results. But they are always able to keep going because they're always able to keep experimenting. So on the one hand, you have a lot of dissensus, that is disagreement. A lot of disagreement about how to interpret the evidence. What the caloric theorist may see is a knockdown argument to the, uh, the mechanical view. Look, heat is traveling through a vacuum and the only stories you can come up with are these ridiculously contrived things about invisible ether or heat being turned into rays and then back again. Uh, whereas the mechanical theorist says, ah, well, we're discovering exciting new facts about heat. So that's the disagreement in science. But there is also a consensus under that disagreement. And it looks like this. First of all, very importantly, uh, these scientists agree that when they disagree, as they do in every round, the way to resolve those disagreements is to do more experiments, okay? To conduct an empirical test, to make an observation, to build some apparatus, to try something new, put something different in the vacuum and see if that stops the heat, okay? Further, and this agreement maybe wouldn't be very valuable without point number two here, they agree on what kinds of experiments or observations, what empirical tests are relevant to deciding the issue. So even as they disagree how to interpret the evidence, they'll agree on the kinds of things that would be uh, uh, good experiments to do, good observations to make. They have a kind of consensus on procedure 
even if they don't have a consensus on how to interpret the products of that procedure. Okay. Maybe you think that's not very not very, not very much, but uh, as I I'll, I hope to convince you, it's quite a lot. All right. Uh, what's the rule then that's guiding the procedure? What's the rule that all these scientists are agreeing on? If I only had four words to state this rule, this, these would be my words. They're not quite enough, in fact, but they get the basic idea across. Only empirical evidence counts. Scientists are agreed that only empirical evidence can enter into their arguments with one another about which theory is correct. Okay. That has to be supplemented, as I said, with some sort of universally uh, recognized standard as, uh, for what actually counts as empirical evidence, what counts as a relevant test. Um, so that's gonna be a part of the rule. But uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the heart of the rule is this idea that, that there will simply be a prohibition on arguing in any way other than by conducting these tests. So in effect, what the rule is doing is it's restricting scientists to arguing in just one way by uh, performing new tests, by digging up new evidence. Okay. And this, I think, this rule is performing the function that Kuhn hoped the paradigm would perform of motivating scientists to, uh, uh, to um, focus so entirely, so wholeheartedly, so single-mindedly on evidence. So the functions of this rule are uh, this. First of all, they, uh, they unify science. They keep science unified. Uh, scientists may be disagreeing with one another, but they're not walking away from, from one another. They're continuing the process of, of uh, throwing more and more evidence at one another to try and win out on their theory's behalf. Second, uh, as long as the argument continues, they're continually uh, digging up new evidence. And what's more, uh, in their quest to win the game, uh, and also to discover the truth, of course, they are, and now I'm going to turn back to Kuhn, they're motivated to investigate nature in the detail and depth that Kuhn emphasized was so important. Okay, so it's not that uh, they believe that there's only one way to do science. It's that they're locked in this desperate, uh, but also exciting struggle to uh, argue for their own theory, for the, say, for the molecular theory of heat. And the rules of science tell them the only way they can win this game, win this argument, is to do more experimentation, to uh, uncover more embarrassing facts, embarrassing empirical facts for the other side. Uh, that's the only way they can win the argument. That's what pushes them to spend years, decades, millions of dollars uh, on uh, intricate little facts that are going to ultimately decide the issue. So they dig up these facts. And finally, in the end, the evidence starts to pile up on one side more than the other. So for a while, the caloric theory of heat had a good run. But in the end, when enough evidence was piled up, it turned out to be unsustainable. Uh, it was no longer possible to defend it, to come up with new stories uh, that would make it seem okay. And so we have convergence on the truth. That's how scientific progress happens. Scientific progress happens because of this evidence and evidence in enormous detail. One more thing I want to add to this story. Uh, these rules of argument are the rules for public scientific debate. They're not rules about how scientists privately think about science, but rather about how they can argue with one another in scientific journals. So this, what you see in front of you right now is the arena in which only empirical evidence is allowed to count. Okay, now um, uh, what I'll do, we're gonna take another quick break to see the results of the poll, and then I'll be back uh, now that I've talked about why science, how science works uh, with the story about why science, why it took so long for science to arrive. Okay, so I'm gonna share the results of the poll. Um, are they visible to everyone? Did you see them there? I think, I think you need to stop sharing your screen.
Okay, so these are the results on the first question. Which area would you least like to work? We had more or less an even split between gravity wave detection, finch spotting, and search for the brain hormone. For what is the most ingredient of good science? The overwhelming majority said evidence, that was 80%, and the others were roughly evenly split. And then the best example of a paradigm shift, people preferred realist to abstract art. And then the others were roughly even except for the Trump to Biden option. So I'm gonna stop the share and we'll continue. <laughs> Michael, you're muted. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Am I now unmuted? Uh, I said, I, I, I was saying, I think I tilted the playing field when it came to evidence as the important ingredient of science. Uh, hold on. Okay. So uh, this, this exclusive focus on empirical evidence as the way to win the science game is how scientific progress happens by motivating scientists uh, to, to investigate nature with Kuhnian detail and depth. But why did it take so long uh, to figure out that what really mattered was this kind of incredible commitment to observation and experimentation? Aristotle knew that evidence was important. He knew that the, the, the right theories were gonna be the ones that agreed with observation. The wrong ones were gonna reveal themselves because they disagreed. So what was he missing? Well, he wasn't missing anything. Uh, his problem in a way was that he wasn't missing enough. He had too much going on. Uh, he thought that uh, not just agreement with the evidence, but philosophical coherence and plausibility was important too. Um, and it's not so much that there was anything wrong with philosophizing, uh, but it did distract him from pushing his inquiries to these extremely um, quantitative detailed observations of such things as the motion of falling bottle bodies that might have if the circumstances had been right led him to become uh, the founder of mathematical physics so aristotle's problem was he was distracted by doing philosophy and he didn't uh, give his all to the evidence here's another figure uh, uh, who we can classify with Aristotle in the same way. This is René Descartes, the famous philosopher living uh, at the, the cusp of the development of modern science in the 17th century. Uh, the scientific revolution was starting around Descartes and Descartes himself was interested in the natural world. Um, he, in fact, uh, successfully was the first to explain uh, rainbows, for example. And uh, as you probably know, since he managed to slap his name on them, he developed Cartesian coordinates in mathematics. Still, he's not considered, in spite of his successes and his enormous fame, part of the scientific revolution. Well, what was he missing? Again, like Aristotle, uh, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't missing anything. He wasn't missing enough. Uh, he uh, was too concerned to create a complete system of knowledge. And in his complete system of knowledge, uh, uh, everything was interconnected. It was connected with uh, physical knowledge, knowledge of the natural world was connected with philosophy and it was connected with knowledge of God. If you were to uh, graph some of Descartes arguments, they might look something like this. And I don't expect you to uh, work your way through this. But this is just to give you a, some sense of the way in which Descartes' physics depended on his metaphysics, which depended on his philosophy of knowledge, which depended ultimately on theological arguments about uh, God's omnipotence and goodness about, upon God's not wanting to deceive us. And Descartes put a tremendous amount of time into, into uh, connecting the different parts of the system, making it into a wonderful coherent whole. But like Aristotle, this took his attention away from the little details, which at the very same time in the observations of Galileo and Newton were creating the new mathematical physics that would be the basis for observational science in the centuries to come. So Descartes was uh, paying attention to evidence, but he was distracted by philosophy 
like Aristotle, and also by theology, or if you like, by finding God's place uh, in the system of everything. Well, you might wonder, is it really true that modern scientists uh, are entirely concerned only with evidence? The answer is, and there'll be a little twist in the tail here, the answer is no. Here, for example, is a famous 20th century physicist, Murray Gell-Mann, who believed that uh, the beauty of a theory, like, like many modern physicists, he believed the beauty of a theory uh, uh, was uh, a part of the reason to believe it. Okay. Um, I'll give you a, an example of one of Gell-Mann's uh, pieces of beautiful reasoning. Okay. This comes from the early 1960s when he was thinking about um, how to make sense of the enormous number of fundamental particles that were turning up in particle accelerators all over the world. And he created these mathematical structures into which he could fit the particles and that created a kind of organization. This is an example of one of the structures. Now, in this example, you can't see anything like the true, the true symmetry that Gilman discovered that requires some rather higher mathematics. So this is a little bit like trying to appreciate the beauty of a Greek sculpture by looking down on it from above. Okay, you can kind of see the parts, but you can't really see the proportions that uh, make everyone's jaws drop. But what Gelman found when he put together the particles and the structure was that there was an empty spot that's down at the bottom left here. And um, based on his desire to fill out the structure, to complete the symmetry, to uh, find the elegance in nature uh, that he believed was there, he predicted that this particle must really exist, okay? Now he could have stopped there. Maybe Aristotle would have stopped there. Maybe Descartes would have stopped there and said, I have the most wonderful argument for the existence of this new particle, the omega minus, he called it. But he couldn't do that. He may have been uh, convinced of the merits of aesthetic thinking of paying attention to beauty in his own mind. But the rules of science say that if you wanna win the argument, you need experimental observations. Here's another uh, physicist, Brian Greene, in his book, The Elegant Universe, putting the point very nicely. So this is simply going back to only experimental evidence counts. Aesthetic judgments do not count. Judgments of elegance and beauty do not count. You cannot publish a paper in a scientific journal saying, believe in my new particle, because it completes this most lovely structure that I've devised. You must make some sort of empirical prediction. And so when Gelman made his prediction, physics went to work. And uh, at the Brookhaven National Lab, not too far from where I'm speaking, about 60 miles east of New York City, the scientists uh, started spending, hundreds, hundreds of scientists started to go to work, spending thousands of hours and millions of dollars looking for this new particle that Gell-Mann predicted. And they found it in this diagram on the left. Uh, it's down existing just for a few moments at the bottom left there, uh, but I, this will not be on the exam. So uh, the particle was observed, Gell-Mann was vindicated, he won his Nobel Prize, and this is a, another terrific example of science uh, not pausing with the argument from beauty as it didn't pause with arguments from religion or philosophy, but rather uh, going the extra distance, the huge distance in terms of dollars and hours and share person hours um, uh, uh, to, to dig up a fact that would ultimately the ba basis for that standard model that at the Large Hadron Collider, they're still trying to destroy. Okay, so, Science works because it upholds the idea and forces the idea that only empirical evidence counts. Aristotle's problem was that he believed that philosophy counts too. Descartes' problem that he believed on top of philosophy, religion counts too. Uh, many modern physicists believe, may believe beauty counts, but because in order to win their Nobel prizes, they can't appeal to those arguments, they have to go back to the facts, to the Kuhnian facts, the investigation of nature in the, as he put it, the unimaginable depth and detail that makes science such a success. 
but wait a minute, I was supposed to be not just telling you that science took a long time, but explaining why it took so long. So why didn't Aristotle or Descartes come up with the scientific, uh, 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 this, this crucial rule that only empirical evidence counts? The reason, quite simply, is that the rule is irrational. Here's a principle of rational argument. When you're trying to figure out what to believe, take into account everything that you think is important. Okay. Now, scientific argument is not allowed to do this. Uh, in, when uh, Murray Gell-Mann was publishing his uh, thoughts about fundamental particles, he was not allowed to take into account beauty in his publications. Uh, if Aristotle were working today in a scientific lab, he would not be allowed to give philosophical arguments. Descartes would not be allowed to connect his science to his philosophy or his religion. So these thinkers uh, uh, would, would be forced, and in the case of Gell-Mann, were forced to ignore relevant considerations. But that means they're being forced to violate the principle of rational argument in their publications, okay? Um, scientific argument, in other words, is violating a principle of rationality. So it looks like a terrible idea, okay? Science is so successful because the rules of scientific argument are irrationally narrow. That's where the motivation comes from. So to create modern science, uh, humans had to, as it were, discover by accident, because they certainly weren't, weren't going to figure it out by thinking about it, that irrationally narrow rules actually work really well. And that's why science took such a long time to figure out. Well, if you want more, here's my book. Uh, I tell the whole story there. And thank you very much for listening. Okay, thanks. Do you mind unsharing your screen? And I'll do that. All right, and I'm going to come back on and release the second poll as before we move to Q&A. For those of you watching on YouTube, if you have any questions, just bear in mind that we're in a little bit of a delay. So just type those in and I'll try to get to them as they come. But first, let me do that poll and we can. Okay, so the second poll should be visible to you on Zoom if you're watching this by Zoom. And if anyone has questions on the Zoom chat and the Zoom session, please indicate that to me either by typing something in the chat or raising your hand. Okay, so I have one question from YouTube in the meantime, and I know Professor Berkey might have had a question. I have him here on the panel as well, but this question is from Dorothy Herr at Albright. She asks, does the focus of science on empirical evidence to the exclusion of philosophical, aesthetic, or other consideration create dangers? That's a great question. So um, might scientists by being so narrow uh, ignore considerations, perhaps moral considerations, that uh, we might really wish they had paid, att paid attention to. One example, a couple of examples of this, this sort of thing spring to mind. The scientist in China who started using the gene editing, uh, recent gene editing technology to, um, to create human embryos that he thought at least would be uh, resistant to uh, HIV or a little earlier, scientists are experimenting with uh, extremely virulent um, flu uh, influenza viruses and engineering viruses that were far more dangerous than any that exist in the natural world. Maybe we would be better off if uh, scientists were a little less narrow-minded and paid attention uh, to some of these moral concerns. Nevertheless, I believe that we would lose what is so important and powerful about science if we had scientists second guessing themselves in these ways all the time. We're better off creating an extremely powerful tool and then supervising it extremely carefully uh, than we are, uh, as it were, building the safeguards into the tool itself. I know that sounds dangerous and I agree, I agree. There's some real danger to it. 
but uh, nevertheless, I think it is our, our best option uh, for using science to, to avert all of the dangers which are so obviously coming down the pike uh, in the next few decades. Great, thanks. Um, this one is from Lua Koenig. Is this understanding of modern science, or, yeah, what do you see as the role of creativity and intuition or even serendipity in scientific progress? Well, both, both Kuhn and I need our, need our creators, right? Kuhn, even if Kuhn thought that most scientists were, were uh, locked up in their paradigms, when Einstein was called upon, he had to be there to create a new paradigm. <laughs> Uh, I think scientists are, are creating new ideas all the time. So my heat scientists uh, are uh, making progress partly through perpetually trying to explain away embarrassing uh, or potentially embarrassing empirical results and perpetually coming up with uh, interesting, uh, often quite inspired ideas about new experiments to do. So even if you're even if you're very narrow, as a scientist, you're very narrowly focused on, on only arguing empirically, there is enormous scope nevertheless within that very narrow scope for being creative. I think that uh, uh, if there are scientists listening to the talk, they'll recognize that, that the, many of the most successful scientists are most successful, not only because of their incredible attention to detail, but also because they're, of their uh, great creativity in thinking up new experiments. So we need, we need the creativity uh, along with the kind of single-mindedness that directs all that creativity towards, uh, towards the building of, well, basically apparatus. I'm gonna before I I'm, I'm gonna share the results of those polls before I read another comment. I hope they're visible. So people thought that Leonardo da Vinci would make the best scientist over Monet, Picasso, Coombs, and unsure. That was 55%. As far as the most important problem for science to address in the next 30 years, 65% chose climate change, 21% pandemic management and prevention. I wonder where that came from. And then for the question for what scientists are least likely ever to agree on, 53% whether God exists and only 9% shows why toast always falls on the buttered side. So that's it for our polls. I'm gonna read a comment from John Pankratz. He's recommending you look at Elizabeth Eisenstein's book, The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, because it goes a long way in explaining the timing of the revolution we're describing. And what? Yes, anyway, that's just a, a comment there. I can type that for you later. Uh, I don't know if Brian Berkey, or did you want to ask a question, Brian? You, you bet, Yuval, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute myself and turn your video on for that. There we go. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that uh, for that talk. Um, I, I guess uh, one question I had is uh, sort of more related to your book. I mean, obviously, with your talk, you're giving a, a very brief summary of what's in the book, um, which is excellent, by the way, and I, I would recommend it for uh, for all the uh, the listeners here. Um, but m my question was, uh, you put a lot of emphasis in talking about how the scientific revolution came about you put a lot of emphasis on, on the role of Isaac Newton. Uh, and I, I'm just kind of curious, I'm trying to understand exactly um, where that fits into your overall argument. So I, I guess I would phrase this as a counterfactual. If Isaac Newton had uh, gotten the plague as a student and died, um, what impact would do you think that would have had on the scientific revolution itself? Uh, and in particular, the development of what you call the iron rule, which is what you were describing your talk today? I suppose if I'm going to answer honestly, I would say I have no idea what the impact would be in the short term. Um, but I'm pretty confident that by, let's say, the late 1700s, so that would be about 100 years after Newton's um, premature death, by about 100 years later, we would have mathematical physicists, physics in pretty much the form um, that we infected it. We, that we in fact did. Um, so I think that the Newton, Newton did not uh, invent the iron rule. He had a, 
very characteristic approach to doing physics, which, um, which put the virtues of following the rule. So this is the rule that only empirical evidence counts. Put the virtues of following the rule on display in a way that everyone could see uh, just how successful you could be simply by trying to explain uh, uh, very small differences and observations. But I have the feeling now, of course, I'm, I am not, I'm guessing, but I have the feeling that the time was right uh, uh, for, for, uh, for other thinkers to come along and, and maybe not by creating something as, as comprehensive as Newton's physics in one, one swoop in his book, The Principia, but nevertheless to create parts of that. Um, and, and so to, to discover the merits of only empirical evidence counts without Newton. So I'm thinking of thinkers like Galileo and Huygens who were uh, uh, both, both doing science in Newton's vein without quite uh, doing anything that added up to his um, uh, almost unbelievable achievements. All right, so maybe I'll ask one last question before we let everyone go. It's a, a semi-provocative question for a liberal arts student's audience. So if you're right and science's progress requires that people be narrow and not ask broad questions, are we making a mistake giving people broad liberal arts education? Should we, should we not be doing that? And by doing it, are we compromising the future of mankind to solve our most difficult problems? That's a good question. I think that on the one hand, um, experience shows that the liberal arts education doesn't get in the way of the kind of narrowness we require from scientists. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but on the other hand, as a as a uh, philosophy professor and a and a, um, a fan of the the humanist idea that the liberal arts education is the the soul of at the the heart of human progress, I I feel a little bit sad about that. So I'm quite conflicted, as a matter of fact. I think uh, that I feel happy that the system of scientific education, what happens to a liberal arts student once they're taken off to a PhD program and given a proper scientific education. I feel, I feel relieved that that science, science education is so effective at putting the blinders on. I think that's great news for all of us who are waiting for a cure for COVID and electric cars and all the rest. But on the other hand, I'm a little bit sad that it's turned out that that's what it takes to, uh, uh, to discover the answers to all of these questions. Uh, I think it would have been wonderful, if impossible, had it turned out that Aristotle's and Descartes' way was the right way. All right. Well, I, I share the same conflict. And um, on that note, I guess if there's, I think that's it from the audience. So let's thank Professor Strevens for his time tonight. And thanks to all of you for coming. And I look forward to seeing you at these events in the future. Thanks very much.